All right, a remaining topic that we're going to continue on with climate and the Earth's atmosphere involves the Earth and its heat budget. We're, we're looking at this lack of equilibrium, that if there's 100 units of energy coming in, if it's an equilibrium, 100 units of energy are going out. So when we talk about the, the concept of global warming, we, we do need to realize that our planet is warming. And that is, at this point, undisputed. It is not a, a conflict of anybody's interest. It's the, it's the idea of what is driving the, planet, the planet's warming. Is it, is it human caused or is it a natural feature of us being in an interglacial period? And that's something you'll need to sort out on your own. But if the Earth were balanced, if it had a balanced heat budget, the influx of heat would equal that of the outflow. So in this case, greenhouse gases are changing this equation and not allowing some of that heat energy to, be, to, to escape into space naturally. Instead, it's being absorbed, these gases here. Are, are absorbing. It's they are consistent with the frequencies of infrared or heat that the absorbed energies from the Earth, from this incoming sunlight, is remitting back into the space around it, and they are being trapped and they're being held. So, the concept of the greenhouse effect, as we've learned up to this point, is is really the process of trapping heat naturally. So, the greenhouse effect then is a good thing, right? We want liquid water. This is the medium that for allows for complex chemical reactions, right? Life is good. We like life. So the, the there becomes a situation where we're talking about feedback loops and feedback systems. We have negative feedbacks and we have positive feedbacks. And I think that the names are actually kind of misnomers. They're, they're misnamed because a negative feedback is often something that causes stability in a system. It offsets the variable that is changing. In other words, I often consider negative feedbacks, typically they're pretty positive outcomes and positive uh, feedbacks have a tendency of being negative. Positive feedbacks cause instability in systems by increasing the magnitude of the variable that is changing. In other words, it continues to drive it out of control, where negative feedbacks are kind of self-checking mechanisms. And we'll look at a couple examples of this. So an example of a negative feedback that a rise in cloud cover on the Earth's surface due to warming can cause an increase in the amount of sunlight being reflected back into space, which decreases the amount of heat energy added to the Earth system. In other words, it's like a checks and balances here. Increasing clouds from a warming planet decreases the net solar input of heat that the, that the Earth experiences. So it's, it's a checkpoint, it's a, it's, a, it's a balance point that a negative feedback stabilizes the net system. However, a positive feedback loop can, dr can drive something out of control. For example, during an ice age, continental glacial ice reflects incoming solar radiation that drives the Earth even further into cooler conditions, right? As, as glacial ice blankets the, the northern hemisphere or, or northern parts of the planet and the southern parts of the Earth, you're creating a larger reflector that less sunlight, less heat energy is going to reach the Earth's surface. So this would drive it more to, to a more unstable condition. So a negative feedback loop can have positive consequences and often positive feedbacks have negative consequences. So it's kind of misleading. So let's watch this video. It does a nice job of explaining positive and negative feedback. So this is going to be a video that's going to show how the Arctic is not some desolate area that that we can ignore, but instead it's, it's, it's viewed as the Arctic area as the canary in the coal mine, that we can study the what's taking place in the poles to decide what's happening or to help us understand what's happening in the terms of climate. The surrounding the North Pole may seem like a frozen and desolate environment where nothing ever changes, but it is actually a complex and finely balanced natural system and its extreme location makes it vulnerable to feedback processes that can magnify even tiny changes in the atmosphere. In fact, scientists often describe the Arctic as the canary in the coal mine when it comes to predicting the impact of climate change. One major type of climate feedback involves reflectivity. White surfaces like snow and ice are very effective at reflecting the sun's energy back into space while darker land and water surfaces absorb much more incoming sunlight. When the Arctic warms just a little, some of the snow and ice melts, exposing the ground and ocean underneath. 
the increased heat absorbed by these surfaces causes even more melting, and so on. And although the current situation in the Arctic follows the warming pattern, the opposite is also possible. A small drop in temperatures would cause more freezing, increasing the amount of reflective snow and ice. This would result in less sunlight being absorbed and lead to a cycle of cooling, as in previous ice ages. Arctic sea ice is also responsible for another feedback mechanism through insulation. By forming a layer on the ocean surface, the ice acts as a buffer between the frigid Arctic air and the relatively warmer water underneath. But when it thins, breaks, or melts in any spot, heat escapes from the ocean, warming the atmosphere and causing more ice to melt in turn. Both of these are examples of positive feedback loops, not because they do something good, but because the initial change is amplified in the same direction. A negative feedback loop, on the other hand, is when the initial change leads to effects that work in the opposite direction. Melting ice also causes a type of negative feedback by releasing moisture into the atmosphere. This increases the amount and thickness of clouds present, which can cool the atmosphere by blocking more sunlight. But this negative feedback loop is short-lived due to the brief Arctic summers. For the rest of the year, when sunlight is scarce, the increased moisture and clouds actually warm the surface by trapping the Earth's heat, turning the feedback loop positive for all but a couple of months. While negative feedback loops encourage stability by pushing a system towards equilibrium, positive feedback loops destabilize it by enabling larger and larger deviations. And the recently increased impact of positive feedbacks may have consequences far beyond the Arctic. On a warming planet, these feedbacks ensure that the North Pole warms at a faster rate than the equator. The reduced temperature differences between the two regions may lead to slower jet stream winds and less linear atmospheric circulation in the middle latitudes, where most of the world's population lives. Many scientists are concerned that shifts in weather patterns will last longer and be more extreme, with short-term fluctuations becoming persistent cold snaps, heat waves, droughts, and floods. So the Arctic sensitivity doesn't just serve as an early warning alarm for climate change for the rest of the planet. Its feedback loops can affect us in much more direct and immediate ways. As climate scientists often warn, what happens in the Arctic doesn't always stay in the Arctic.